There we go. Okay, welcome everyone. So glad to have you here. We have an excellent discussion for you today. Um, we're going to be hearing from um, folks at the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, the National Consumer Law Center, and Elevate um, to discuss their water affordability advocacy toolkit, which was recently released. Um, the toolkit offers a menu of utility and state level solutions to lift up experiences, best practices, and policy recommendations from community organizations, advocates, and others around the country to address affordability. Um, so today we're going to hear from Larry Levine from NRDC, Olivia Wine from the National um, Consumer Law Center, and Brianna Parker um, from Elevate, and we'll also be sharing a short clip um, from a new documentary film, Whose Water? The People's Movement for Safe, Affordable Water and Sanitation in, in the United States. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into the presentation, and we will have about um, 15 minutes at the end for questions. Feel free to put them in the chat throughout. We'll be monitoring that, and we'll also have an opportunity to come off mute and ask your questions directly. Handing it over to you all. I think Brianna's up first, as soon as we can get the, the slides rolling. Can you all see those slides in full screen? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I am I'm ready to go. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Brianna Parker. I work with the organization based in Chicago, uh, Elevate. Um, I'm here on behalf of Elevate and um, an organization that I've been a part of for um, for over a decade now, the People's Water Board of Detroit and their special project, the National Coalition for Legislation and Education on Affordable Water. Next slide, please. All right, so I am here highlighting a, a project of Who's Water, I mean, of um, the People's Water Board, uh, NCLEA Water, and we have, uh, um, we've been doing some work um, over that decade and even further back working on a film called Who's Water, and I'll, I'll talk about that, but just talking about like how we uh, organized and got to this point and some of the other like highlighted work that we're working on that we would love for you guys to be a part of. Next slide, please. So just the quick overview, of what I'm, I'm going to talk about who we are, the People's Water Board of Michigan, based in Detroit. Our approach, uh, we have a three-pronged approach, and then I'll highlight the, the, play the clip of the movie and then tell you guys how you can get involved. Um, and a special shout out to uh, NRDC and NCLC um, because we've been working together and their work with the toolkit that they're, that they're going to talk about and our work with the with the film are, you know, we're talking about the stories and experiences and they're talking about the policy behind it. And we, I mean, we all know at this point we need everybody in this fight. So next slide, please. All right, so like I said, the work is rooted in the People's Water Board work. Um, I'm also a, a member of an organization called Michigan Welfare Rights, which is one of the uh, anchor organizations to the People Water Board. So um, in 2014, the People's Water Board, in 2014 and in 2015, they had a convening about water affordability. Um, so it was 22 states represented, different countries represented to talk about some of the water affordability and sanitation issues that were going going um that were going on and how there were synergies and how we could work together and what was needed to really solve the problem of water affordability um, so the convening, there was an agenda with that convening that we'd all stay in touch and would work with local activists and find these water stories to highlight them so that people can know that they're not alone in, in the struggle. Um, and so that's what the work has been um, birthed out of. So it was a convening in 2014 and then 2017 to talk about water and how we could come up with legislation, how this film could be used across uh, cross coalition um, everybody can use this film and talk about it and, and use it to advance water affordability and some of the sanitation issues represented. Next slide, please. All right, next slide. 
All right. So that previous slide showed that it's this three prong approach. So the film is is really storytelling. We also are working on national legislation um, and getting people involved in that because we believe that there needs there needs to be national affordability legislation on the national level. Um, and then we also have a discussion guide so that communities can talk about water affordability or water sanitation and just some of the issues to continue those convenings because it's a way to build power. Um, so I'll talk about the film and say that it was not just the story of Detroit, but Detroit is definitely um, highlighted. The film is two hours. It's the hour and 50 minutes, so you might as well sit for two hours. Um, we are working on different cuts of it, but as it stands now, it's two hours. So after I show the film, I'll also like give information about um, a, a sign up sheet so you can like host a film screening. Um, the, the story follows different communities. So like I said, Detroit, Highland Park, we all know about Flint and the issues there. The Navajo Nation, um, Martin County, Kentucky. I see folks from um, Martin County on the call. Shout out to Martin County. Uh, Lowndes County, Alabama, Philadelphia, Des Moines, I Iowa. Um, yeah, so it's gonna talk about sanitation and, and with the Navajo Nation. It's gonna talk about affordability and, and it's gonna talk about water access. So next slide, here's the actual, the actual um, clip. I hope you guys enjoy. I'm going to go on mute. Okay. Um, just wave at me if you can't hear it for some reason, but I'm going to hope. Imagine you're on the Titanic. All of the lifeboats are gone. You have to not only find a way to stay alive, but you have to fix it so that this circumstance doesn't happen again. The watering facility is uh, where people have to drive in from miles and miles and miles and miles out. With, you know, their water barrels. We are left with millions of cubic yards of radioactive material. I started to keep all of these water quality violations every single quarter, every single year. 2002, 2003, 2004. We're paying more for water than anybody around here, and it ain't fit to drink. The monoculture of corn, soybean, hog, it is the dominant force in Iowa politics. They want to externalize the costs of production by putting a mess in the river that those of us downstream who depend on those rivers for drinking water uh, have to finance to clean up. I was getting water bills that were topping like four and five hundred dollars a month. My water was shut off for eight weeks. Do we become fiscally responsible where we have, hey, we got a great credit rating, but we've got 500,000 more people without water. You need to pay a thousand dollars today. Right now, it's like some things is not doable. There's nobody that doesn't need water. It shouldn't be something that somebody will lose a home over. This trader called me $114,000. And we don't have a separate tank because it's caused more than this house worth right now. I learned that people were being arrested because they had problems with on-site sanitation. This is along the Selma to Montgomery Marsh Trail. Every year, business people get on the bus and go and worship at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But all along, off these side roads where people are living in conditions that are akin to places around the world that don't have the kind of wealth that exists in this country, it makes absolutely no sense. The water crisis is a political crisis. If you try to fix water quality without addressing the power structure, then you're not fixing anything anyway. I think I'll probably die thinking that I ain't done enough. Uh, gotta stay up. <laughs> what do we get for what we gave? And survival should be the bare minimum. Thank 
you. Thank you all for, um, oh no, not again. Okay. All right. So, so I'm going to send out some information just about like how to sign up for the pre-screening and I'll kick it to Larry and Olivia. But before I do, I just want to say that most of the people in, those, in that film, like I, you know, I've been playing these, uh, these clips and most of the people in the film are, are, are dead. Like, like that's how serious water affordability and like these issues are they're connected to life and so the storytelling like we talk about the stories but the reality is though he did die trying to protect water and so kicking it to you larry and olivia please sign up for the screening let's talk about it thanks Bianca. um and before we go to the next slide oh, sorry i was gonna say uh Pick up your pick up your phones and scan if you haven't yet that QR code um, that can get you to the web page for requesting a, a screening of the full film. And you know that that film and then the the trailer really helped to set the stage uh, for why the policy issues that we're addressing in this toolkit are so important. Um, so we call it the Water Affordability Advocacy Toolkit. Um, you can go to the next slide um, and. It, I'll say as a preface, it does not attempt to address all of the issues that are in the film. Um, it's got a focus specifically on affordability of water service for those who are served by uh, centralized water and sewer systems. Um, and there are, they, I think that there's a common thread of, un of underlying causes and solutions that run across the country in communities that are served by those sorts of systems. Um, and there are uh, an even broader set of issues that apply um, in other places as well. And we did not attempt to capture all of that, um, but we, we feel like we've got a pretty useful uh, resource that we did put together and we hope you'll agree. All right, so we'll move to the next slide. Okay, so just a little bit of background, um, probably not news to anyone on this call, uh, but water service, the cost of water and sewer has been rising uh, for a long time now. Um, increasingly unaffordable, particularly for low-income households. Uh, you often hear water systems saying that their rates are affordable. That may be true for the average customer. Doesn't mean it's true for uh, for a large number of people who are, by definition, 50% are earning below average, right? Um, and many much more below. Um, bills have been increasing rapidly for more than two decades, even as household incomes have stagnated for most of that time. Um, so you can see that, that these two graphs uh, there's some comparison of, of water rates to inflation rates, uh, comparison of uh, increase in water bills to other essential household expenses and, and to inflation. Um, the highest, sharpest increase is always water there. Next slide. Okay. And an important distinction to draw uh, between the water sector and the energy sector, because those are the key utilities that people think of uh, when we think of uh, utility bills and, and affordability of utility bills that people receive. Um, in the water sector, there are a lot of systems, right? Nearly 50,000 water systems, that's not even including the tens of thousands of wastewater systems that we don't have a great accurate count for. Um, in the energy sector, many fewer. Um, another important difference is that most water and sewer systems are publicly owned, uh, whereas most energy utilities are privately owned. And that has an important difference for how they're regulated uh, and how the oversight works. Um, in most instances, privately owned utilities are regulated by a state utility commission and publicly owned utilities are not. So most water systems fall into that category of not regulated by a state utility commission uh, with respect to their rates or terms of service. Next. Another key thing about the water sector uh, to understand that affects how we think about policy solutions. Most systems serve a small population, but most of the population is served by the larger systems. Right. Um, so the the blue bars on this graph uh, are, are showing the large number of systems at the small end of the scale, uh, but the green bar is showing the bulk of the people at the end of the scale where the, the large systems are. Okay. Next slide. 
So water affordability is an issue of environmental justice and racial justice. Right? It just does not affect everyone equally. Uh, there, there are disparate impacts on some more so than others. Um, rising cost of water and sewer services results in economic hardship, stress, the loss of water access due to forced shutoffs, which jeopardizes health, housing, and even custody of children. And these impacts are not evenly distributed. Lower income communities and communities of color are especially hard hit. And the, the image here is of the cover of a, a great report by NAACP Legal Defense Fund uh, that takes a look at the intersection between race and water affordability uh, and looks at, it takes a historic view, how did we get where we are, uh, including things like redlining um, and discrimination provision of services and how different places ended up with better and worse quality um, water and sewer services and the implications of that in turn for affordability. Next slide. In the toolkit, we talk about the human right to water as a frame uh, for advocacy. And that's not our idea that we came up with, that's reflecting um, the framing that many, many advocates, many frontline advocates especially, have lifted up in their work on this issue. Uh, there is a, in international law, there is a human right to water and sanitation. Uh, and it's identified as being foundational to enjoying all of the other human rights, water is life. Right? Um, and in the US, that international human right is not codified in domestic law, in, in national federal law, uh, but there are a couple of states, California and Virginia, where there's legislation that has been enacted that recognizes uh, a human right, a right of access to safe and affordable drinking water. Um, and there are similar bills that have been introduced in other states. Um, in, in California in particular, um, that law that was enacted uh, around a decade ago has really been a launching pad for a series of policies and programs that have helped to move in the direction of actually securing that right to affordable water. We'll talk some more about that later. Next slide. Uh, one other thing uh, for context here, uh, I talked before about the comparison and the contrast between the energy and the water sector, um, the solutions um, or the, and the objectives uh, do have a lot of similarity, right? And NCLC uh, and NRDC and a number of other organizations that work on uh, energy, utility affordability um, and, and water uh, to an extent as well. Um, we all came together last year in, in the wake of uh, the, all the disruption uh, of the COVID pandemic um, seeing how that has elevated attention to the importance of uh, affordable access to essential services. Um, and we developed this uh, uh, roadmap, um, sort of a utility customer bill of rights of sorts, uh, with bedrock principles that we believe uh, uh, can inform policy across the board, across energy and water, um, across the country. Um, and those those principles around affordable access are reflected as well throughout the toolkit. Um, it's re this this uh, Bill of Rights is reproduced um, as a resource in the toolkit too. Next. Okay, so how did we go about developing the water affordability advocacy toolkit? Uh, it's a collaborative effort by NRDC and National Consumer Law Center. We had a team, a core team of five folks working on it. Um, but what was really critical to the process is that we started out by interviewing advocates uh, and activists and academics from around the country. Uh, and a few of them are, are on this webinar right now as, uh, as attendees. Um, through those conversations, um, we uh, decided to focus on 10 issue areas and prepared modules on each of those um, with the idea that they can be used, each module can be used independently or as a, as a whole. Um, and we shared our working drafts with all of the interviewees and got feedback um, so that we could come up with a product that we hope uh, both reflects the best insights and wisdom of those who are in the field and uh, provides uh, value to advocates around the country um, by understanding what the experiences have been to date. Next. 
and I won't linger on this one too long, but here's just a list of um, all of those who were uh, engaged as interviewees and providing feedback. Um, that whole list is in the toolkit as well. Next. Okay, I'm gonna hand off to Olivia. Thank you. And, and thanks everyone for um, spending time with us to talk about um, water affordability and, and these two resources, the movie and the, the toolkit. Um, as Larry said, we um, prepared each of the sections as modules. It's a recognition, you know, going back to one of Larry's earlier slides showing, you know, that the vast majority of um, the water systems are, are publicly owned, not privately owned, and it's a very local issue. And so it's the problems won't manifest themselves the same way from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and the solutions will not be the same from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So there was no like one size fits all template. Um, so what these modules are designed to do, we, and I'll have a slide further down, showing that sort of thematically you can sort of clump them together, but hopefully um, it will help with the issue spotting. If, if you're noticing certain patterns emerge in your community, hopefully um, one of these modules can sort of guide you towards um, what other, others have done um, to address that particular issue. Um, it's, it's really focused on the individual household affordability versus you know the water system affordability. It can be used by um, community activists. It could be used by policymakers, you know, any, anybody, frankly, who has an interest in addressing water affordability. Um, next slide. We tried to um, create sort of a uniform format for the different modules. So in each of the modules, there's gonna be an explanation of the issue, um, a little box with questions that will help with the issue spotting. Um, the modules will contain what we could find in terms of examples of, of um, good state and local programs, policies, consumer protections um, that could be used possibly as examples. Um, pitfalls, you know, where we find like cautionary tales. Um, so again, each of the modules will have these components, common components. Next slide. Here's, um, as I noted, there were like thematic buckets for the modules. So uh, there's a little overlap, but here's the first theme. Um, for the modules about protecting uh, people from losing access to water, we have modules on shutoffs, liens, debt, billing problems and dispute resolution, protections and support for renters. Next slide. The second theme is um, modules addressing how to make water service affordable. So we have a module on affordability and assistance programs. We have a module on equitable water rates, a module on efficiency and plumbing repair assistance, and again, protections and support for renters. And then the third theme, next slide, is enabling more effective advocacy data collection and transparency, and we'll go into that one um, later on today, and accountability and participation in decision-making. So these three sort of categorizations um, make up this uh, water affordability advocacy toolkit. Next slide. We're gonna do like a deeper dive into a couple of the modules just to show you, uh, you know, how they are laid out. Um, but hopefully you'll take a look. We did have the goal of not making each module too long. Um, certain chapters, certain modules like affordability and assistance, I think that's the longest one by nature, um, are going to be a little bit longer than the others. Uh, but that was our goal. The end notes, I will also say, are, are kind of critical. The end notes are where you're going to find sort of the leads, the starting points, if you want to sort of delve deeper into a topic. And also at the end of each module, uh, where we could find some resources to lift up, uh, we've lifted the uh, we've listed those there. Next slide. Uh, 
Okay, so um, for example, in the water shutoffs module, there's going to be a box where we talk about an overview of the solutions and tools in the module. And so, for example, with shutoffs, it's um, combining shutoff protections with bill relief, um, establishing shutoff protections for vulnerable individuals, prohibiting shutoffs during billing disputes, um, or when um, folks are applying for assistance, um, uh, strategically adopting uh, temporary shutoff moratoria to buy time to work on the larger systematic fixes. Um, ensuring adequate notice and an opportunity to contest a bill before a shutoff. So making sure there's fair processes around shutoff, um, eliminating fees at the back end, like if you're trying to get people reconnected um, or other you know, sort of uh, prohibitive costs that have been added on because of the cost of debt and debt collection. Preventing water shutoffs um, <laughs> when bills are combined with, this is a big problem. Combined billing is a popular um, municipal practice, um, but what that results in is that people can be disconnected for water for, for debt that may be unrelated to water, that's other municipal debt. So tackling that nut, I would just like to elevate as a key one uh, in terms of policy advocacy. Um, hopefully that one will be included in, in the asks. And uh, just wanted to highlight uh, flow limiters <laughs> as a problematic practice. Um, some are, uh, municipalities may see this as a compassionate way to avoid a complete shutoff, um, but advocates in the field living with this type of policy practice are, describe it as absolutely miserable um, for the co um, consumers. And hopefully, you know, we, we can get to a point where we deal with affordability before we get to these sub subpar services. Next slide. Um, here's an example of the types of in detail uh, water shutoff protections. And again, you know, this is sort of acknowledging that <clears throat> water is a local issue. Uh, so the problems manifesting themselves will differ from locality to locality, the solutions will, and the opportunity for solutions. So we provide a sort of menu of the different types of water, water shutoff protections um, that we were able to find and to lift them up to, to, to provide a menu for advocates as they're pulling together um, strategies to deal with water shutoffs. And again, um, no one module is a silver bullet to get to water affordability, but hopefully, you know, packaging with water rates and a rearage for, you know, water debt, we, we can help you find a more sort of comprehensive approach um, to the problems um, in a particular community. Next slide. Um, again, that's, that's the rest of the list of the, the different types of water shutoff protections. Next slide. Um, here's another module, affordability and assistance. Um, here I wanted to highlight, we were very intentional about um, our use of the word water affordability in describing a program versus a water assistance program. And we fully realized that others in different contexts will use those ter terms interchangeably. But for the purposes of this water affordability advocacy toolkit, we were highlighting programs in the water affordability program section that at least made it a goal to get to the individual household affordability, making sure that that or the goal is to get a bill that is affordable for that household month to month. Um, versus assistance program, which we treat as a larger bucket, and it can cover things from crisis assistance to a bill discount, um, which could be, you know, closer to generous or less, you know, generous, but it's not the goal in that program design isn't that making sure that each house, the household's individual monthly bill is affordable from month to month. Um, it, it's more like a flat uniform discount applied to all households that are eligible. Um, and, and we fully acknowledge also, again, 
that these modules can be used in conjunction with others. So affordability and assistance programs, you know, ideally can be packaged with rate design and, you know, efficiency programs and debt programs. So, or, you know, you may find that you're in a conversation where affordability is the only sort of discussion point on the table. So maybe, maybe it is the main module to be focused on. Here, um, under the affordability assistance programs that we lift up, um, there's been some interesting work in Philadelphia and Baltimore with the percentage of income payment plan. So we sort of feature those. Um, and that is where the, the bill is tiered uh, towards a percentage of the household's income. Um, there are uh, strategies to overcome barriers to program implementation that we get into. We also talk about best practices. So in the appendices, you'll see a section where it talks about um, you know, eligibility criteria and outreach efforts as well. Next slide. So here uh, is what this is the uh, oh be right these are the pips the percentage of income payment plans that we um, feature in the affordability section, um, and we realize that here the issue is going to be you know how much funding is available for the pip program so can it be universal or are you going to be really helping a select fewer number of households. I mean, this is a strategic discussion for the advocates in a particular jurisdiction, but it is a compelling type of program to look at. And I hope you, you get a chance to take a look at both of those program designs. The other thing about PIPs that I think is a best practice is packaging a PIP with an arrearage forgiveness component. So if you can get the bills to an affordable amount each month, um, work the ability for that household to um, earn arrearage forgiveness, just entirely for retire certain amounts of the debt to clear the back debt. And I think when we get to intergenerational water debt, that's really, really important. So um, these are water debts that could lead in um, to the loss of the home. So uh, I would elevate also the water debt uh, module as one to, to take a look at. Next slide. In the appendix, Appendix C, so um, again, it, it is more attention paid towards uh, the two uh, percentage of income payment plan uh, models. Uh, and, and there are other, and we note the, there are other smaller PIPs out there, um, and we note those as well, but we just thought we'd feature these to give folks a better sense of, of how they work. Next slide. As I noted in the appendix, we've got a section on best practices, but we, we look at program design issues, um, ways to streamline application processes, um, how you set eligibility thresholds can you know, create a narrow funnel or larger avenues in. Um, we also lift up the particular issue of households um, that are not U.S. citizens, don't have the citizenship status, um, it, where possible to not make, to not include a citizenship requirement or to not require a social security number on an application opens um, the avenues to assistance. And I will just sort of note if you couple this with um, rate design and affordable rates from the get-go, you can protect a whole bunch of households. And then, you know, these programs can work together to really help those at the struggling with household affordability, direct the assess assistance to the, those households on top of affordable rates. Um, next slide. I'm gonna turn this slides over to Larry for a bit. Um, as we move forward. All right. Thanks, Olivia. Um, so on the affordability and assistance programs, um, what's out there now exists at the local level, individual utilities, municipalities. Um, there's an opportunity to do the same uh, with some 
pros and cons at the state level. It doesn't exist yet, right? This exists in the energy space, but not in the, uh, the water space. And the place that's done the most work on developing a statewide program is California. And that grows out of the human right to water law there. Uh, there was a subsequent law requiring the state water board to develop a program proposal uh, for how it could be done. What could it look like? There was an extensive process of stakeholder engagement, um, uh, advice and consulting provided by academic experts. Um, and they came out with this uh, really voluminous report uh, that I highly recommend uh, to anybody interested in, uh, in, in thinking about a statewide approach. Um, it not only offers recommendations, but has some really detailed appendices that explain other things they considered, but decided not to recommend and the reasons why, the pros and cons. Um, it's got translated into the actual legislative language that was introduced um, in the current session of the legislature. The bill, in fact, passed, uh, but then was vetoed by Governor Newsom. Um, and the reason that he gave was that there was not funding that went along with it. There was no appropriation uh, accompanying the, the uh, bill that would authorize the program. Um, you know, the strategy of advocates on that uh, was to try to get the program established and fight for funding to follow um, if, if funding couldn't be secured at the same time. Um, the, the governor, unfortunately, um, uh, did not uh, agree with that strategy, um, but the fight's going to continue there. Um, another thing to, to another ex couple examples to note on the statewide level, um, Illinois uh, is the only place that does have on paper um, a law that's been enacted that, to create a program. It's only on paper because there's no funding for that one uh, either. Uh, and the, the reason that I, I recommend looking at the California model more so than the Illinois one is that the, the, the Illinois law is pretty skeletal, has very little detail on what a program might look like. Um, it, uh, it instead really directs an agency with very little guidance uh, to develop a program uh, if and when funding becomes available. Um, one other statewide approach that we note is um, states can provide assist technical assistance or funding to local utilities uh, to help them develop local level programs. Now, this is something that Michigan has done um, with a series of grants to, uh, to individual uh, utilities uh, who have used them to have uh, uh, a scoping process, a, um, a, a public engagement process of uh, developing um, proposed affordability programs. Right. Um, and that was enabled by a little bit of seed money from uh, the state uh, to get that underway. That's something that um, I think actually could be a, a good use of uh, bipartisan infrastructure law funds. Uh, that's something that technical assistance dollars could be used for if the state chose to use them in that way. Next slide. Okay, and we're going to uh, spend uh, the, the last few minutes on a couple of the other modules, a taste of those. Um, so the, the last grouping of modules was on uh, solutions that help to make advocacy more effective. Right? The first of those two in that group was data collection and transparency. So as anyone who's done work in this area knows, uh, there are some real data gaps in understanding the full extent of water affordability challenges. Even just finding water rates can be hard. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're trying to get an understanding across locations of, of what the cost of water is. Um, and much less having good data on shutoffs or on liens uh, or on uh, uh, late fees and penalties that are, that are charged in a punitive way. Right? So this module is all about uh, finding ways of increasing the transparency of utility policies and practices and, and their impacts uh, by requiring enhanced recording of data. Uh, ideally at the zip code level or the census tract level so that you can look at um, disparate impacts, which communities, uh, which neighborhoods, which populations are being most affected. Uh, and we also spend a little bit of time there on uh, ways of obtaining data through public records requests, uh, through rate setting proceedings where there is a formal proceeding in, in some places. Um, that's primarily in the context of investor-owned utilities where they have to go to a utility commission to raise rates. But there are also some instances where publicly owned utilities have a more formalized process that looks something like that. 
um, and that has um, an opportunity for uh, for formal discovery um, in, a, in a legal sense or for requesting and having uh, a right to obtain certain data to inform uh, advocacy in a, in a rate proceeding. Um, and then litigation as well, in some instances, has been a tool used to, of course, to seek um, remedies, uh, but in the course of that, to be able to daylight uh, data from, uh, from the utility. Next. So I think the, the leading edge here is mandatory reporting laws, right? A state law that requires uniform reporting of, a, uh, of an essential set of data by all water systems across a state. Um, there are, are a few examples of this. Um, New Jersey, Illinois, California, and Wisconsin all have some degree of statewide reporting uh, that covers both publicly and privately owned systems. Um, other states have adopted uh, requirements on a temporary basis during COVID uh, to monitor what the impact um, of uh, the, uh, the economic impacts uh, of COVID, how that affected ability to pay for utility services and access to service. Of those four examples, uh, New Jersey and Illinois are really the most notable. Um, they have the broadest suite of data that's collected. And in the case of New Jersey, a law that was just adopted there this summer is the, the first in the nation to apply that to all public, all publicly and privately owned water systems, um, water and sewer systems, in fact. And so there's these two states are going to have um, the best, most robust data set emerging and can provide a model for other states to follow. The image on the left here shows what the, uh, the utility commission in Illinois has started to do with their data that's coming in. Uh, their law only requires investor-owned utilities to report. Um, and both of these states' laws, I should mention, cover water and energy utilities. So they're grouped as a whole, um, the utility sector, right, for purposes of advocacy uh, that I think proved to be effective and for purposes of, uh, of implementation. It provides some uniformity and, and some understanding of affordability challenges um, that households face when they've got more than one bill to pay. Um, the same household that's got a water bill almost certainly has an energy bill too, right? Um, so there's some of the, the work that's being done with the, the data, but it's entirely available online from, you know, at the raw, raw data from each utility in Illinois that reports. Uh, and in New Jersey, that will be the case as well. Uh, raw data will be posted and some requirements for the state utility commission uh, to do some uh, analysis of that data and offer some findings and recommendations to the legislature as to whether existing programs are or are not sufficient to meet the need. Next slide. Blair, I just want to note you've got about 15 minutes left. Oh, great. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up so we have uh, hopefully a lot of time for questions and answers. Uh, the, the last one that we'll, that we'll give a teaser on is the accountability and participation in decision making. Right. Olivia uh, emphasized how um, Everything is local, right? With water systems, it's so disaggregated. Decision making is often at a hyper local level, um, but it's really critical in doing advocacy to understand what the decision making processes are. Um, what's the oversight? What's the governance? Um, and uh, how, where, and when those decisions, critical decisions happen about rates, about uh, rules on shutoffs, uh, about anything you can think of. Um, understanding that is critical to being able to develop an advocacy strategy. And this module tries to provide um, a, a roadmap of understanding what the different variations are that you may find in your community uh, and what that means uh, in terms of opportunities for advocacy. And then in addition to that, it offers some ideas of how you can advocate to improve the decision-making process so that you have more opportunity to be an effective advocate, right? Um, and, and there are a, a lot of different models that can be drawn on uh, and adapted there. Next slide. And we can, in the interest of time, uh, skip through this one as just a little more detail on what you'd find in that module, which um, do you think is, is, is well worth a look. Okay, so what next? Um, please spread the word about this if you think it's a valuable resource. Um, uh, one page or handout, we wish we could hand it to you through the screen. Uh, we used this slide at a, at a uh, conference presentation, but we, there is a one pager that you'll find on the, on the website 
site with the module, uh, sorry, with the uh, toolkit as well. And we'll have on the next slide a, a link and a QR code to find uh, the entire um, toolkit. Um, we are doing webinars, we're doing, uh, we'll have blog posts forthcoming. Um, we really want to find ways to uh, grow an, a, a lasting and ongoing conversation um, among groups who are working on this issue. Um, that's something that uh, Brianna alluded to a bit that uh, the National Coalition for Legislation on uh, Education and for, uh, I'm, a, Brianna, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to uh, bungle this. Uh, education was added to the title of the uh, of the coalition, but the National Coalition for Legislation on Affordable Water. Um, something they're trying to do as well, um, and uh, and we hope that the toolkit can can be a jumping off point for for some of those conversations. And then last, I'll just flag this. We'll hopefully have another webinar on this coming up uh, sometime in the coming months. Another resource that'll come out soon from NRDC uh, that advocates can bring to their utilities uh, to provide a tool for them to analyze what are the financial implications of adopting um, an affordability or assistance program uh, and help make the case uh, financially that it's worth their while to do it. Okay, next slide. All right, so there's the QR code uh, and the link. Um, we are always uh, open and eager for questions and conversation after today as well. So there's our contact information um, and we'll transition right into questions. Maybe can you leave up for a minute the, the QR code while we start on the questions? Yeah, sorry, just one second. Um, yeah, I will share it again. And uh, y'all, if you would like to uh, ask a question, you are welcome to raise your hand, uh, come off mute or type it into the chat and we will try to get through all of them. Can you, can you see the QR code? I'm never convinced that it works. <laughs> All right, so we see some questions coming in the chat. Um, I, I can just I can go through those if, if you want to. Okay. Um, all right, we'll we'll go through these in in the order they came in. Uh, can anyone point me to information on Virginia's human right to water legislation? Um, yes, um, go to the uh, go to the toolkit homepage there, um, and in the background module, there's a section that talks about human right to water and examples of. Um, of where that's been uh, used. And there's a link there um, to the Virginia uh, legislation. This again, comes back to the end notes that Olivia emphasized. There's something like 600 end notes uh, in here, and that's where you'll find the original resources that, that we drew on um, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the analysis and, and recommendations in the modules. Okay, uh, next, Calif uh, just a note. Uh, Cal that California recently provided state funding to extend their LIWAP program through 2026. Uh, LIWAP is the low income uh, ho household water assistance program that was funded uh, with a billion dollars in federal funds uh, as a, a COVID relief measure. The federal funding runs out uh, in September of next year if it hasn't been spent um, uh, you know, previously. Um, so just a note here from a participant that, that California has added some money of, of their own to extend it. Okay, some other notes uh, from folks uh, sharing information about what's going on in their states or communities. Um, here's another question. Can you share any uh, SM, oh, this is a, sorry, this is a direct message. Uh, <laughs> I'll see if it's relevant to the whole group. Um, yeah, someone asking for just uh, uh, materials to help uh, advertise this through your own channels. Yes, uh, we're certainly happy to share more. The, the, the web page itself um, is really the best place to direct people. And as I mentioned, there's a one pager on there that's sort of a, a flyer of sorts um, you know, promoting the toolkit, what it is. Okay, another question, uh, can you please talk about how the toolkit discusses investor owned slash publicly owned utilities? And understanding the challenges and opportunities of both. Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of rich material on that. And it's that last module uh, that really gets into it the most, although this distinction pops up in numerous places. Um, Olivia, you, do you want to speak to this one a little bit and what some of what the, the, uh, the toolkit has to say about it? Um, this is the public versus private. Yeah. 
yeah, it, it it really goes to sort of when you're figuring out the political ecosystem or where the levers of change are, you know, and figuring out, you know, who's created, who's responsible for the credit and collections for the utilities, um, where, you know, who could create the affordability programs, um, who can create termination protections or arrearage forgiveness programs. Um, the state utility commissions tend to, uh, with the exception of one state, Larry, which is that one state, um, they focus on um, the privately owned utilities, um, and those are the regulated utilities. And so, you know, it's it's almost like you, if you go there and can open up a sort of issue wide docket to deal with, like for example, credit and collections practices of the utilities, then you can cover a whole bunch of utilities at one time. But as Larry's chart shows, most of the water water systems are um, publicly owned. So it really is trying to figure out where, which agency is responsible um, and, and what authorities they have. So the strategy, I think it affects mostly your strategy, but it may also affect um, ability or the familiarity of, of the regulating entity with, with certain concepts. I think that the state utility commissions will probably be far more familiar with things like, you know, the affordability discussion, um, how to deal with, you know, possibly forgiving debt, you know, arrearage management, or we call it arrearage management programs. Um, local officials may take a little bit more um, educating. So having some materials ready to sort of explain you know, um, what is going on and what the possibilities are there. And then sort of pointing to examples, like you wouldn't be the first municipality to do this. The, this similar municipality was able to, you know, approach this, this particular problem this way. Um, I think the other key thing is like how easy it is to find the rules that govern the particular issue you have <laughs> it it isn't so easy to figure out where certain protections are housed with municipal and it's not in the same place for each that's part of the the trick so um may take a little bit more legwork yeah and, and i'll just uh very briefly add and then, and then turn to the rest of the questions um you know there, there's for, for publicly owned systems that are not regulated by a state utility commission um you know, one implication of that is that the state legislature is a place to go uh, if you want to get uniform protections or programs in place, uh, because there's there's not an analog to the state utility commission that's covering those publicly owned systems. For the ones that are regulated by a commission, a commission has a lot of power to act and be directed to act by a legislature, of course, but also has a lot of power uh, to act uh, of its own initiative or by petition from um, from uh, individuals or organizations. Um, and the that last module uh, also talks a lot about how some of the features of uh, sort of oversight and decision making processes that apply in a utility commission, how some of those could be adapted to the context of publicly owned systems, um, even without bringing them fully under the jurisdiction of a commission. Um, you know, that there are some some positive aspects uh, to the procedures there that advocates have found very helpful, where they've been able to get them applied. Uh, in the publicly owned system context. Okay, more questions. Um, can you give a sense of how these affordability tools have an impact on communities with median income of $120,000 versus a community where median household income is $60,000? Um, I'll just speak very briefly to that one. Um, I want to make sure we get to others too. Um, you know, one, uh, you know, one implication of that is, uh, you know, what resources are available to, uh, to fund a program. Right, um, and the, to really have a robust program, ultimately, what what you need is at a local level is some cross subsidization of some customers by others. Right, um, if the overall wealth of the community is uh, is low, um, that's going to place some limits on how much cross subsidization uh, you may be able to have. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't do it. It really requires a close look at the numbers. Um, but on a sliding scale from a community with more high income folks uh, to one with fewer high income folks. Uh, you're, you're going to have differences in relative ease of, uh, of being able to cross-subsidize. Um, I'll move on to another 
Uh, what consistencies are suggested for establishing fair metrics of affordability across places? Great question. Um, the background section deals with this a bit, the background module. Um, there's, there's not any consensus approach on that. Um, we identify some different approaches that have been taken. Um, there are uh, some rules of thumb that the United Nations recommends for percentage of income uh, that, that could be spent on water or sewer. Uh, there's the idea of looking at disposable household income rather than total household income. Um, so taking into account what the cost of living is in a particular community and how much other essential expenses cost. Um, there's, uh, there's, frankly, there's some misuse of some numbers out there, um, including the, the EPA's 4.5% uh, number that often gets cited, but really is taken out of context and was developed for another purpose. We can have another whole conversation on that one. Okay, next, um, for getting the public involved in decision-making, are there strategies to increase eco-literacy so advocates can be truly educated on relevant topics? Wow, that's a, that's a, a huge question. Um, I think I'm gonna pass on that one for now, actually, just for the interest of time. Um, it's a, it is a great discussion topic though, um, and an important one. Um, what are options that can link affordability program funding needs with recent federal investment acts, especially those targeted to disadvantaged communities? Um, so this is a reference to the bipartisan infrastructure law um, that sets aside 45% of the water infrastructure funds uh, to be used as grants for uh, principal forgiveness for disadvantaged communities. There's a lot of discussion uh, going on right now and, and advocacy going on right now around how to define a disadvantaged community, what other elements of the funding program to be put in place to make sure the funds do get to disadvantaged communities, however defined. Um, and I, I think it maybe in the, in the follow-up resources, um, maybe we can send a little bit of information about a forum that's, that uh, River Network helps to facilitate that's exactly about that issue. Uh, I see we're down to just a minute. So let me scan the last questions and see if there's maybe one more we can pick and happy to answer more afterwards. Um, a couple of resources people posted. Uh, okay, here's one. Can you talk about how the toolkit can be used to network slash link advocates across the country as compared with being a static resource that we can access as needed? Um, that's a great question too. Um, and I, I hope that if this webinar uh, um, sparked your interest in getting more, uh, getting more deeply into these issues, um, or if you already are in deep, um, right? That that you'll um, you know, that you'll reach out uh, to, to us, to others um, uh, on here um, about carrying on that conversation, figuring out how to how to have um, uh, you know a, a, a structured network that can do that. I would point folks also to Aaron's response as well, um, because it seems here, you know, there's the space to have these important conversations and to lift up, you know, things that folks are doing in their communities, you know, so it can help, like, if you've got a challenge and you throw it out there to the group, you know, it, it, we're hoping, yes, to get folks talking you know, Brianna's movie that she she lifted up, that is also an important way to start a conversation and build a network. There are going to be folks that want to dig in that are going to, you know, want to know what they can do. And having a place where folks can go to have those conversations is going to be critical. But we're hoping, you know, our, our small piece in this is to help spark those important conversations and to help, you know, through the end notes, and the resources start guiding folks to, you know, possible solutions, but the building of the community, I mean, I think that's where this space here and, and this type of river network conversation is really critical. Thank you all so much. We are at 201. Brianna, Larry, and Olivia, we really, that was just such a jam-packed hour, and I look forward to this conversation continuing. And for all of you who joined, thank you so much. We'll be sending out the recording and slides so you can access all the great um, links and other information that um, was in, in the presentation. Any last words from the three of you? Oh, I, I 
just a shout out to the familiar folks that that helped develop this toolkit. It wasn't just like the work of five people. It it, it took a community to to create this and to to provide essential feedback and critical thinking and you know some tough love, which was also really well needed and deserved. So thank you and thank you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, really, really critical to being able to do this. Yes, same. I just want to say I'm just I'm just relaying information. All the work is each and everybody else. So thank the pe the folks that didn't make it to this room today for all their work, and thank you, Aaron, for holding it down. Yeah, have a great day. <laughs> Take care.